of technology. Uh, it seemed like we are living in the day and age of self-driving cars, but a lot of technologies for the power people with low vision and people in the blind community were like decades old. So what do you do when you can't find a tool? You try to build it yourself. So I found a group of like-minded folks uh, and we set out to work in this area of artificial intelligence for the blind community. Our first uh, prototype built at a hackathon at Microsoft was this uh, smartphone for the blind community, which could talk, a talking smartphone. Uh, I mean, we don't get props for being fashion forward, but we get props for actually building prototypes in a short week, duct tape to the head MacGyver style. So this phone, you could talk to uh, an app that was running, which was using computer vision, and you could think like visual question answering, image captioning, uh, trying to navigate and trying to see what you could do with leveraging some of the research work that's available. Uh, from that, we brought this experience into a smart glass prototype. Keep in mind how I say the words prototype because that's not real, right? So you iterate through the technology as you can find uh, uh, with my friend Sakib, uh, who's uh, using these smart glasses, which he has programmed on the back end where you can click on it and it will take a photograph of the scene, try to understand it, and then answer the questions that he's controlling the API behind the scenes. So with more support, we started to see and ask the question, how can we get it in the hands of as many people as possible? And the answer was, well, what we need is a free smartphone app. So with blessings from the CEO, we cranked it to an 11, and in under a year later, we released Seeing AI, the talking smartphone app for the blind community from Microsoft. Uh, I mean, you can already see, it's, it's like a Swiss army knife of computer vision. It can do many things. Uh, you can probably see that I'm already very excited about talking about it, but if you couldn't, this app could help. One face near center, five feet away. Eugene near center, five feet away. Process, 37 year old male with a mustache wearing glasses looking happy. You know, many people have mailed us that when their partners get angry, they use the app to take a photograph of their partner and cut the tension right away. And well, we are in a deep learning.ai webinar, so how could I not show the photograph of Andrew Angie playing with this app? Uh, I think this is like two or three years old now. Uh, so, uh, you know, we started to, so we released the app and uh, we really were, you know, boring engineers and scientists who release things out, but we just are focused on the accuracy, the performance. But that's where the magic started to happen, that people started writing mails to the team talking about what are they doing with the app? So some people mentioned that there's a salesman who's using this with a bone conducting headset to discreetly hear the emotion of the people he's selling it to and know that the person is not really bored, so he can pivot his pitch too. Uh, as you might have also seen here, the, the app is trying to do real-time face recognition because for privacy reasons, we cannot often store things for legal reasons on the cloud. So we said, you know what? If you have a friend, you can give the phone app to them. They take three photographs. And then using something we read in the uh, computer vision, uh, deep learning.ai course, Siamese networks, triplet loss, train a network on the device itself that you could uh, use to recognize your you know, face. Now, if you think about the technical challenge, uh, on a phone which is 2016 phone, 2015 phone, this needs to run in near real time. Uh, it needs to be robust to different lighting conditions. And so that's where like your theory gets starting to come towards practice. And you start to realize that, you know, my phone needs to support last four years worth of phones because that's where my 95% of the people using it would be living and using. Uh, and so you need to really crank up the floating point operations better. Uh, so going uh, next. Uh, we realized that people started to use the phone uh, for a different reason. There's apparently a person in the middle of a $5 bill. His name is Mr. Lincoln. And people would train his face to start recognizing currency notes. So we said, OK, we, we get the idea. You want currency recognition. So let's train a real currency recognizer. So we trained it. And then five US dollars, 10 US dollars. Runs pretty fast. That's what we want it to be. The, the key thing to notice is that, you know, a $5 note, great. But if you have fingers over a $5 note as you're trying to use it, that is a usability issue that your convolutional neural network needs to support. 
people have fingers on top of the currency note people might be using the phone in a dark alley or you know maybe the sun is behind it so it needs to be robust enough to different uh, uh different uh lightning conditions so what we realized is it took you know anybody who knows transfer learning would take about 2 days to train maybe i'm over exaggerating it takes 2 hours to train a convolutional network with transfer learning uh you know few lines of code and we think okay you know this is great everybody can use it turns out that's where the accuracy and precision metrics really come into hand you cannot tell someone who cannot know this currency note that a uh, $100 note is a $10 note you need to have your metrics really scaled up so one of the things we realized is that uh especially like in europe a 50 and a 5 if you add a hand on the $5 part it would say a 50 note is a $5 note or if my camera is looking at a close up of it you could say something wrong so we realized that we really need to only speak if the phone is slightly you know further away square say about 6 to 12 inches away so what we did is in the convolutional network we actually made sure that if it thinks it's a close up if it thinks it's blurry it shuts the hell up and does not speak and it only speaks when it's ultra sure that the person has kept the phone there is enough evidence so it might already know which currency note it would be but it will keep mum till you bring your phone about 6 to 12 inches so when we released it people started going into the app store reviews and saying this app doesn't work i kept the currency note and it's not saying anything and even though they have read the tutorial they are still complaining about it and then they realize that magically that when they bring it about 6 to 12 inches away the camera can see it closely and then complete the task what we noticed that people started to build muscle memory after one or two times using the the particular mode successfully that to get success they have to use the phone correctly so we had to use ai to change a usability problem and then that's when we were able to like ship this in production in a good quality way i'll go a little forward so you know the area of you know image captioning trying to explain instead of just faces the you know the body the background what people are doing in this particular case the app would say processing a man jumping in the air doing a trick on a skateboard pretty neat so margaret mitchell who is one of the world leaders in the vision to language work was working on this since 2010 and we are lucky to have her on the team and uh, uh and so you know it does things decently but it's still like a 3 year old it makes mistakes so the sentence you would hear is that when this works it's magical uh while keeping the intuition that this can be wrong so by being upfront about its capabilities and that this is not correct all the time it's just giving you a general idea what we learned is that if you bring realistic expectation to the users people use it with those expectations and are more delighted instead of saying that hey this works amazingly and then they find those issues uh that would probably not be something to do so we said okay we can go to image captioning but could we go to the next level bringing object detection and the physical world in front of them so here's an experience where you do image captioning first processing a person sitting at a table with a laptop in a living room processing and then use your fingers to explore the location of object six items detected move your finger over the screen to explore table laptop hello couch 38 year old man with black hair and a beard looking neutral couch hello couch so now the question is about usability what would you use object detection for in a case like this and the answer is that this is giving a spatial location of things that you might not go and touch right in front more importantly it turns out that the app has a feature for exploring your previous photographs in your uh, phone's directory and then you can go and look at your memories things from your honeymoon or things which you know, which you have taken previously or if you have like a like a receipt or something you can move your finger and read the text so the usability comes from uh it's not the technology but the usability factor which makes the technology actually useful that we need to think about so going to the next level uh the app gives you all these directions about uh you know research being used to explain but one of the key learnings we had was that it's 
we are running a lot of things initially on the cloud and cloud there's like a two to three second delay you send an image and it returns back there's latency there but if you can make things in real time you can give real time feedback and real time feedback is immensely important to get uh, uh, to make people successful before they even go to the next task so an example was you know people take photographs uh, but they know the friend is somewhere in the center uh, and uh, you know they perfectly pose the photograph they take it they realize that their friend is not smiling they scold them and then retake the photograph so we suddenly noticed after releasing the app that a lot of people were taking selfies and posting them on facebook and there are like loads of them and again being geeks we just never thought of these types we were just concerned about the accuracy and the latency and just watching those stories keeps you know people in our team and many more places motivated to like go into ai and see what impact they can build in whatever field they want to do uh so this is kind of exciting to see and it's really important because uh posting photographs is a social thing you know being able to communicate emotions is a very social thing and now having an easier alternative to do that by just doing it yourself instead of asking your friends is just amazing so we had another thought hey you know how about we put uh, text reading onto the app and again the came up question of latency came in so we tried to do it on the mobile side made it slightly fast enough that it could you now be used in real time 130 so you could use it at a hotel to know your hotel room uh you know you could go to a hotel use it to know your hotel number uh, room number your exit sign the temperature on the thermostat i mean things that you would you know control yourself but you need it to be in real time and the feedback we learned is many people did not know how much text was around them in their real world and that was the magical experience of it some people started put, sitting in the back of cabs pointing the phone outside and trying to learn new stores that have opened in the neighborhood chipotle mexican grill office fedex office one user put the phone on a tripod uh, turned their television on and then started watching korean movies someone's coming i'll look into it and text you baby you know in a very similar way we put uh things like uh reading handwriting onto the device and uh you know being geeks we released it in december december means christmas time christmas time means greeting cards and then suddenly we started getting mails about people reading greeting cards for the first time someone read a love letter written to them 40 years ago uh after 40 years that was magical uh parents started writing that they have for the first time read their daughter's homework and for the first time scolded them because they now know that the homework isn't done tears of joy become tears of pain so here's another example of usability in ai together uh people said what do they want they want product recognition we said simple we will slap a barcode reading library inside the app and job done and keep our colors up so we put a barcode reading library out and just started walking as if you know we deserve a nobel prize uh and then we went to usability studies and basically just got slapped there so You, have you ever gone to like Walmart or Target and tried to use one of those uh, like laser barcode scanner? Never works, right? Now imagine a blind person trying to use a cell phone app when they don't even know where the barcode is. Like we never even realized that, right? And that's the issue with bringing an engineering mindset to a problem that people need to use. So then we went back to the drawing board, uh, and then we trained a convolutional network on thousands of barcodes at different lighting, different orientation. and the probability of it being a barcode we would attach a sound so the higher the probability it would actually start to beep more and then we would see an experience like this process coca cola 6 ct so to do that before people would buy these 12 1300 $1, laser barcodes kind of the kind you see in walmart right uh, and now people can do that with you know a free app on the phone that's the power of ai building this is probably not that hard you know but the part about where the value rises is something to be motivated by when you know whatever thing you are building so uh, i have 3 minutes so i'll just quickly go over some quick other examples this is my friend greg stilson he's the inventor of the most used uh, braille tablet 
Um, and while we were working at Ira, he asked me a question, could you find my shoe? So he had a keynote conference and 30 minutes before his keynote, he couldn't find the shoe to go to the conference. And he calls Ira, which is a service where there's somebody, a remote agent who can see your live webcam uh, through the phone and guide you. So he used Ira to you know, go around in this particular room and try to find where the hell did he keep his shoe? So he's going around, going around, trying to find a shoe, no success yet. Um, so he's using the agent on the other side who's giving live assistance. And eventually the agent and the person, you know, Greg together find the shoe. So Greg asked me, hey, could you do something to find that shoe slightly faster? I heard you know some AI. I said, okay, let's use some AI there. So we used a technique called structure from motion and took that video and joined them together to construct this 3D, uh, this, I'm not gonna say bad things about PowerPoint, it's my mistake. Uh, okay, so uh, we are able to uh, construct this 3D replica of his hotel room. So then Greg asks, so we use this and then because we can use 2D object detection, we can project it back in the 3D world and actually mark the points of the bed, the TV, the door and all. So Greg asks, well, could you not just use this to navigate me in like a bigger building? So we did a quick pilot. And in this pilot, this is like a big store. And uh, with uh, videos of three people who used it in the pilot, we joined the data together and build a 3D structure of an entire store. And uh, it works more smoothly when I'm not streaming, but just expect that there's a 3D replica moving around. And now that we know the 2D floor plan, because you can see from the top, you can navigate a person from one place to another place and tag the places with deep learning. A last very quick thing, you know, just as an idea to throw over. This is a project, you know, in uh, we are building in open source. And the idea here is, uh, could you build a virtual guide dog? The question is that, you know, when you walk around on the street and see a millennial walking towards you, who's looking at their phone, what do you do? You jump to the other side, you dodge them, right? That's what you do. Similarly, when, you know, you're walking on the street and your GPS says, hey, you have reached your location. You don't just stop there. You turn to the left, find the door of the building and walk towards it, right? That's what a normal person would do to finish their task. Similarly, when you see a red light turn green, you start walking on the pathway, right? That's what you do. Now imagine if AI could guide you in doing that. And if you think about using, you know, making a lane detector, making a red light detector, that would all be a lot of individual training for individual things. And that's like death by a thousand needles as they call in robotics. So the question was, could we not just record a ton of video people walking who are sighted, let them react the way they do? And, uh, and based on that, predict what's happened in the future. So I have this GoPro here uh, on which, you know, I just record myself walking around because I have nothing else going on in the evenings uh, and I want to lose some weight. And while walking around, then you can use things like SLAM to build like the trajectory of how the person walked. And then, uh, and then uh, now here's the cool thing that happens. Using the video without any labels and just using the accelerometer, you can take three seconds of video to predict what's going to happen in the next three seconds by the person who's watching the video. So using video to predict how the human is going to behave in the future. Here it's saying that two seconds in future, the person is gonna start walking. And then that's exactly what happened eventually in the video. When you look at this millennial walking, uh, it, it's telling you that two seconds in future, you're actually gonna dive him. And two seconds in the future, you're also going back in your state. That's what happens when you have hundreds of hours of video. The cool story here is the person, uh, the first author on this paper, Surya, is a second year undergrad working in biology who just got excited about AI. And it took five weeks to basically build the prototype around it. A problem like this would probably take three years to get to production. But if we can all together work in uh, open source, release it there, it's easier for people to bring it. So to end my talk, I think I just want to come up with like 30 seconds of these learnings. If you want to build AI, it's probably a good idea that someone who is a developer, researcher, PM designer in your team is also a user, right? So that is how diversity comes, not as a tester, but as somebody in the team of equal part of the team. Often it's not the shiniest things, but like the simplest things which can have the greatest impact. Uh, look, this is an area where it feels as good as it does. So it's good to get started, but then don't end it without having a real impact. 
when you see the thousandth post on uh, building a COVID mask detector, it's great as a motivation to learn AI, but like, what's the end goal? Like, are actually going people going to, you know, wear that? Things like that matter. Usability matter keeps realistic expectations. But here's a quick tip to get famous. Produce a data set, produce notebooks, and then publish them on TensorFlow data sets. And you'll be famous because everybody will be citing you and using your work. Uh, and if you really want to reach as many people, release your technology in open source and let another provider who already has access to the users like release it out. You know, I think releasing to users is the final goal of the thing. So technology is the great equalizer and it levels the playing field for everyone. Uh, reach out to me if you know you have an idea about working in open source on AI for accessibility. And I'm even more excited that the person about to talk about will take that story and tell you how you can win grant money to take this tech, you know, story ahead. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Cool. That was honestly so awesome to hear. Um, really inspirational, honestly. Um, next up, we have Dr. Lawrence. Um, Megan Lawrence is the Senior Accessibility Technical Evangelist at Microsoft with 15 years of experience working with the disability community. Dr. Lawrence builds trusted relationships with customers, NGOs, and assistive technology partners to further Microsoft's mission of empowering every person and organization to achieve more through the lens of inclusion. Megan works deeply with customers and the disability community to keep them up to date on the latest at Microsoft Accessibility, including how we can partner with organizations to help build a culture of digital inclusion. Dr. Lawrence is the co-chair of the People with Mental Health Conditions discussion group within the Disability Employee Resource Group at Microsoft. She leads the Accessibility User Research Collective, a partnership with the Shepherd Center as a way to improve the accessibility of Microsoft products through feedback from people with disabilities. This project engaging the disability community that helps shape the future of tech at Microsoft. Outside of Microsoft, Megan is a board member of the TechSage Rehabilitation Engineering Research Center, focusing on developing tech to support people aging in place for people living with long-term disabilities. All right, after that really long list of awesome achievements, uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Megan Lawrence. Oh my gosh, thank you so much. That really was um, an incredibly lovely uh, introduction. I just want to check in that you can see my yes. screen and my captioning, yes? Fantastic. Okay, Anna Rude, you ended with a guide dog. Um, so I had to quickly come back uh, with my own guide dog. Um, so this is Vine, who uh, has retired to my home. Uh, she is age nine and living the life of luxury, uh, sitting on my couch eating cheese. So even though I get extremely excited about the idea of a virtual guide dog, really, they have to come and look just like dogs, <laughs> though. <laughs> um. But, you know, part of, you know, what I really want to ground in is that we are living in incredibly extraordinary times. And so, you know, I've learned a lot about inclusion and in AI um, during this global pandemic and the, uh, you know, elections that we have coming in the United States, uh, the racial and justice movement that we've seen uh, on the ground in many of our cities is that we really are learning and relearning how to build cultures of inclusion as we speak and that people want to belong to something bigger than themselves, right? Community is incredibly important. So our friend and family communities, our extended neighborhood or religious communities, but certainly our work communities are more important than ever. And we're using technology in a way that I don't think we really previously have to make sure that we're keeping those connections because society and being able to have the connection with other people is incredibly important, not only for our physical and mental health, but for the way that we collaborate with people um, in the workplace. But communication styles vary widely. Um, so for example, I am one of these people who loves to have my camera on. I wanna see your expression. I wanna see that you're paying attention to me. Um, while other people really feel like the camera can be distracting because they may be somebody who needs to stand up and stretch during a meeting and may not want to interrupt. 
Or you may be using something like captioning, which Anna Rude showed, and I'm also showing here embedded into PowerPoint. And so now what we realize is that what we're doing is engaging people with multiple senses. So this is called a universal design learning environment. UDL, it's a long way of saying uh, that when I engage you with multiple senses, you quite literally just remember more information. Now, AI is powering those captions. You, well, first of all, Anrood had an incredibly uh, powerful demo, being able to show the human impact of when technology really meets the needs of what people want. And I really want to continue to bring back having people with disabilities on your teams, making sure that you've got people with disabilities uh, involved in the research of not only how you make uh, your next piece of technology, but in the data that we collect, because we recognize that AI runs on data. Now, just to ground everybody here, I do want to recognize that one in five people have a disability. So uh, we really are a pretty large group. Um, and the good news is, is that if you don't have a disability today, like, don't worry, you will, um, because we're all aging into a disability. And I'm sure you guys all have a, an example of breaking an arm or having eye surgery or some sort of temporary disability, which has fundamentally impacted the way that you either um, interact with your environment and certainly with technology. And so that's really some of what's incredibly powerful is beginning to think about how when we lean into that inclusive design lens. So when you use AI to power your next application and you think about how that will improve the lives of somebody with a disability, we see that that is ultimately providing great flexible technology that frankly just everybody wants. So one of my favorite examples, again, talking about speech to text here, is uh, I have fibromyalgia, which is a chronic pain disability. And so I can't sit and type at my computer all day long. That's just not how my body works. Uh, and so I use dictation. Uh, in order to write emails, in order to write Word documents, um, and make sure that I can communicate with people. Um, but think about all the people who have broken their arm. Uh, I gave a great presentation at uh, one of the local schools here in the Seattle area where I live, and I asked, you know, what is what what's it like? Who who's broken their arm? And of course, this one, you know, student raises their hand, very excited to to be called on, and he said to me, you know, when I when I broke my arm, the whole world looked like a keyboard, like very classic, you know, uh, a dramatic response. Um, you know, he, he said, I couldn't I couldn't text my friends and I couldn't do my homework, um, noting that texting friends came first. Uh, but then we showed dictation and he goes, oh, yeah, I do that all the time on my phone. Um, and we said, what are you talking about? He said, well, I always use the text message or the microphone on my phone to send text messages. So now when you think about AI, when you think about enabling ways for people to simply input information in multiple ways, whether that's with their voice or maybe with their eyes, now we're really beginning to think about what the future of computing really can look like. And when we use inclusive design as that powerful engine, that's when things get pretty exciting. Now, part of what I want to make sure that we discuss today is that AI is amplifying human capability. It is not taking something away from somebody, but instead enhancing the world around them and their ability to make decisions. So for example, I am a huge proponent of CART, which is humans providing live captioning. We don't wanna see that go away. What we wanna see is a world in which AI can make it more correct so that we can begin to see really, really good quality and low error rates for people who may be deaf or hard of hearing. So in the back of your mind, always be thinking to yourself, you're not fixing somebody, you're not providing a tool that they're gonna use to help them be better in their life. You're simply giving them information about the world around them to make the right kinds of decisions. And that's really what it means to lean into empathy and think about inclusive design. 
Now, Anna Rood uh, uh, alluded to the fact that it that we really <laughs> we're literally giving money away. Um, that is not something that I always get to say in my job, but it is uh, one of the, the more fun things that we get to do is to really find those opportunities of partnership. Uh, the world around us is filled with creative, wonderful ideas, and we're really looking for how we can help each one of you bring that crazy cool idea to fruition. So our AI for Accessibility program is a five-year, $25 million grant program that really is looking for projects that want to use AI to, again, amplify human capability. Uh, I truly believe that AI can be a force multiplier when we think about the way that we deliver accessible technology. It's going to make the difference in what it means to provide natural user interface design, right? Use the computer with your voice only. Use the computer with your eyes only. Use the computer with gesture. Increasingly, we see people using gesture as a way to interact with all kinds of technology, whether that's HoloLens or the way you turn on and off lights using Alexa or any other type of smart device in your home. Heck, I can even see who's ringing my doorbell by looking at my phone, even if I am in another state or another country. So I do want to ground in the fact that AI is deeply embedded in our lives in a lot of different ways. And I encourage you to sort of stop and think about how it's used today, but really how we can use that tomorrow to, again, provide the kinds of information that allow people to be independent. That's one thing that I love about seeing AI, which on this slide, I have a picture of somebody using seeing AI because this is about liberating people to be independent, to be able to understand what's going on in the world around them without necessarily having to engage somebody who may be cited. So we're really looking at a couple of focus areas. Um, one of them is employment. We know that people with disabilities are twice as likely to be unemployed. And the hard truth is that COVID is growing that number on a daily basis. People with disabilities have been disproportionately uh, affected by COVID and employment. So really looking at some of those innovative ideas about how we not only build new systems to engage uh, people in employment, but how do we onboard? How do we think about retention? Um, because what we know is that companies that hire people with disabilities make 28% higher revenue on average. And that's some new research that has come out from a center. That second area is really looking at uh, daily life. Again, how do we think about making uh, solutions and software and devices smarter and more contextually uh, relevant? I think cultural competency is one of the key areas that we as a society that looks into AI needs to examine. Do we have the right kinds of data from the disability community, from other diverse communities, so that the technology that we make is not biased, but is fair. The last category is really around communication and connection. And I think this goes back to what I was originally talking about, which is this is what fundamentally makes us human. We're emotional creatures. And being connected and being part of a community is one to be connected, but really find um, their well-being and their happiness that, that they need. So if you want to learn more, I encourage you to go to aka.ms slash AI for accessibility. Checking on my time here. Um, so, you know, I think it's really important for us to talk about just because you can build it doesn't necessarily mean that you should. Um, and so AI and ethics are something that I look very, very deeply at. We've held a number of workshops on exactly how you build fair applications for people with disabilities. And I come back to the same conclusion almost every single time. And there's two takeaways for me. One, we have proactively uh, gather data about the disability community. And we have got to get savvier and smarter about the way that we do that. But we need to do that by including the disability community in those decision-making processes. 
nothing about us without us, right? And the second piece is, again, involving and having people with disabilities on your teams to help you think through the right way to build the next set of solutions that are going to blow our minds. So I personally want to tell you a story about how I use AI every single day in my life. So I have um, an anxiety disorder. Uh, as you heard, I am the co-lead of employees with mental health conditions here at Microsoft. Now, I would love to tell you that mental health is one of these topics that we openly talk about and are proud of, but the reality is there's still a lot of bias and stigma. And what we've seen during COVID is that the Center for Disease Control does uh, what they call a, a weekly household pulse. Um, in January 2019, 8% of the American population reported having symptoms of an anxiety disorder. That same pulse last month showed 36.5% of the American population is experiencing generalized anxiety disorder symptoms. We know that there's a historic wave of mental health and well being on the rise because of our current uh, environment. And so we need to be even more thoughtful about how we take care of ourselves our families, and what that means at work and at home. So I use uh, a tool called My Analytics Wellbeing. Um, this is absolutely a true story. Um, I, about um, two months after the pandemic started and I'm working from home, I stumbled downstairs about 12 or 13 hours after I had started my day, never showered, still in my pajamas, um, you know, hadn't eaten anything. And my husband says, you know, like your anxiety is getting kind of high, I'm worried about you. And I just burst into tears. And I said, but if I don't seem like I am working all the time, I'm afraid I'm going to get fired. And it really sunk in is that we have to understand the whole person. And so I started using my analytics to say, I'm keeping myself honest. I'm creating boundaries around my work hours. And on Friday nights and Saturdays, I'm going to be present for my family because I want to make sure that I disconnect to recharge. But we know that that has to be a really practiced skill. So my analytics now gives me a purple square every time I do not go back after work uh, or go back to work uh, after hours. Of course, you can set your own hours. It tells me what I am doing uh, when I am going back online. But here's my favorite new feature is that now I get a daily email that just says, hey, would you like me to go and find the time in your calendar that you need for the things that you find important for your mental health? So it will automatically book me focus time. It will automatically book me breaks. So those 15 minutes to just stand up and stretch, get a glass of water. And that is all powered by our own AI. It seems so simple, but these are the types of tools that absolutely revolutionize people's ability to take care of themselves. I call these apps for wellness advocate or app, app, yeah, apps for wellness advocates. Who's your advocate? I really see mental health as an area of, of growth in AI and one that has a lot of opportunity that just has not been realized yet. So maybe you are thinking in your mind of a really interesting way to help people stay connected and then get the downtime that they need. Now, I want to spend just one more minute as I start to close up on how it is that we can continue to work together. Now, one of the things that we found is that in working in the mental health space, we recognized that we didn't necessarily have cultural competency and didn't understand the uh, or have the data that was um, reflective of our Black and African American communities here in the United States. And so coming up on October 27th through 29th, we're going to have a workshop on mental health, societal bias, and Black communities. We're really going to dig in and say, OK, how do we address mental health, uh, build those data sets that are going to ultimately make great next gen tech and use AI to do that. So I encourage everybody to come to register, listen in. Uh, we've got some incredible speakers uh, that are really going to begin to highlight what this means for all of us as a growing community. And remember that AI is used in so many things including the way that we evaluate new resumes, 
Most of the time, the first pass on a resume is using AI. And we know that they can be biased, biased against women, biased against people with disabilities, biased against people of color. So think about the way that you are building and including new data sets that are truly representative of the people that live in our communities and not shy away from the hard questions, like how is this gonna impact somebody's mental health or how can I help somebody set the boundaries that are gonna help them be connected and live a higher quality of life. The opportunities are endless. The uh, These are one of these moments where I say, I don't know what's next, but I can't wait to see it. Um, and it's through the amazing partnerships and relationships that we have with one another, like Anna Rood and I have had for many years now, even though he's not at Microsoft anymore, I won't hold that against him. Um, we really do continue our relationship and figure out as a community, as a society, how we are gonna push the boundaries of what's possible for people with disabilities, and we're gonna do it using AI. So with that, I'd love to turn it over. I'm sure there are lots of questions out there. Yeah, thank you so much, Dr. Lawrence. That was really inspirational. And thank you to both of our speakers. Um, this was really awesome. I think it'll help a lot of people um, really be excited about the future of AI and what it really can do for everyone, not just specific groups, you know. Um, and everything is going to be open up. We're going to go through some questions that have been posted on the live stream. Um, I'm gonna ask my question first though. Um, so I wanted to ask, this one is for both of you guys. Um, I wanted to ask about kind of, since if you don't experience it, you can't always know like what kind of gaps people are experiencing. Um, I guess what are some gaps that maybe some people wouldn't think about um, when it comes to really anything with like AI or with just like day-to-day -day life or employment or a lot of the things that you guys were talking about. Oh, I'm here. I'm, I'm getting the key. Go, go, Megan, go. <laughs> a finger point. Oh, yeah. <laughs> he knows I'm passionate about this topic. Um, 70% of people with disabilities are, or 70% of disabilities are invisible. Um, so just by simply looking at me, or interacting with me, you wouldn't necessarily know that I have a disability. So we think we cannot make assumptions. Um, so one of the things that I really encourage people to do is ask questions. I think Anna Rood made such a brilliant point where they were like, oh, this is gonna be so easy to make you know, a, uh, a currency recognizer. And then we started to think, through, well, what is the interaction? What is the usability? So again, you have to be thoughtful about the fact that um, you know, people with learning, 70% of, like 75% of people with learning disabilities never tell their employer. So how are you creating universal design learning applications that empower people, even if they never disclose that they have a disability? Mm -hmm. Perfect. And, and I'll just uh, very quickly add, uh, if you are ever developing literally any product on earth, you need to have a user and you need to know, you need to validate before I'm going to build something, is it worth building? I know the full story end to end, uh, you know, six months from today, one year from today, is this something I should invest effort in? So it's a great idea, you know, to when you do your MVP, you then show it uh, to the user or maybe don't even do that and first start with the user, try to bring them mm -hmm. onto your team to ask the right questions. One trick I found uh, was uh, you could go to, let's say, one user, like let's say a blind user here, a blind user there, or you could go to a rehabilitation expert who works with 100, and then you get that summarized language uh, till you know you have yourself talked to enough number of people. So doing user studies is a good way to know what the problem is to even solve before you solve it. So instead of putting technology before the user, do the vice versa, which is put the user ahead of the technology. Yeah, thank you so much, Jose. Thank you, Alexis, and thank you both. No, the presentations were amazing, like absolutely amazing. They were uh, awesome. It's amazing to see what is going on and you guys, but everything that you guys are doing, anything that you're involved both in the community and from a practical perspective, really thank you very much for everything you're doing and for the amazing inspiration. And, and the audience has been talking about how inspirational both of you were and the presentations were. So for that, we truly, truly thank you. But let's, let's take some questions from the audience. 
uh, put up our first question. Here's from Miss Jessica Harrison. So she loved it, just like a lot of people did. So thank you again for that. Uh, and any additional resources? I know, Dr. Lawrence, you mentioned one there at the end uh, from Microsoft, but any other additional resources for help people kind of understand? I'm assuming potentially both things, both the stigma and the things associated around people with disabilities, but then also about AI applications to be able to help develop applications for people with disabilities. Yeah, so I think our AI for Accessibility program, go Peru, look at the, the website because there's both projects that are happening today to kind of get you grounded in what, uh, you know, is in the marketplace, what people are finding to be important to, to go after. Anna Rude said it so incredibly well. Make sure this is a real human need and that the humans that you're solving it for want it. Um, so go and check check out that site. I also really encourage people to go to Mental Health America. It is the largest and oldest mental health uh, NGO here in the United States. Uh, you can take a screening if you're if you're wondering about your own mental health, and you can find some really great resources for how to build um, uh, mental health resilience, whether that's within your own family or within uh, your organization. Yep. I was also gonna say, you know, just fiddle with your app store and to try to download random apps with a keyword and realize why 90% of them are so crappy. Uh, that's a great way to learn what people are really trying to solve. <laughs> oh, boy. <laughs> Thank you. Um, our next question comes from Joe Jackson. And he says, uh, is there a plan to use this technology to go from one language to another? This is for uh, Megan. <laughs> yeah, we. Uh, it's, a, it's a great question. And yes, uh, we have um, Microsoft Translator, which can translate into over 64 different languages. So now we have some pretty cool, uh, now that we all live in a virtual world, we're all in a meeting all of the time, uh, you can join a meeting and I can give you a QR code. Uh, where you can follow along with the presentation. You know how Anna Rude both and I have the captions on the bottom. You can now follow along those captions in any of the 64 different languages uh, that are out there, including being able to have things read out loud to you. So I think that's one of those really promising areas in AI that I have seen get dramatically better in the last three years. I don't know about you, but when I first started at Microsoft, it was like, ooh, yeah, this is not something we should show customers. And now, this is like everywhere in our lives and, and I feel very comfortable and very confident. So I think that just goes to show how quickly this area is evolving and how much opportunity there really is when we do it right. Mr. Cool, any comments from you, sir? Um, actually, yeah, she answered all the things. It's good for me to be at the end so I have to speak less. Got it, <laughs> fair enough. Uh, this one's from Miss Lauren Kidd. When having a guide dog, are they trained based on what the specific person needs, or is it a general training type of process? Andrew, do you work with guide dogs all the time? I have one, but that's different. I work with your ones. <laughs> uh, so, so generally, um, in general, the they're usually trained at a place, and then after that, there is like an immersion, few weeks of immersion where you know the person and the uh, the trainer basically sort of unite them to get to know each other and gradually bring them in to their part of the life. Uh, I actually wanted to mention a very quick story about uh, a friend who was at on 9-11 on the 76th floor of the World Trade uh, Center. Wow. And uh, his dog, Roselle, brought him down all the way from, uh, from all the way from like top to down. And so every 9-11, uh, you know, uh, he has a uh, full story, which uh, uh, his name is Michael Hingston. I should have probably said that before. Uh, and and 10 years after this incident, I think the Roselle received an award of bravery. Uh, so I think the story is just amazing. And uh, it's worth reading. It's an Amazon bestseller. Yeah, it, that is an incredible story. And I, the other thing is if you haven't watched Pick of the Litter, which takes you all the way through from when the guide dog puppies are born all the way to the ones that make it into service, it's very interesting. Like you can go very deep on what it's like. Only about 50% of guide dogs make it um, through the program. They're often career changed into many other great types of work. Um, but that's one of those, that's a family, that's a family film. It's really good. Can you repeat the film again, Dr. Lawrence? Mm -hmm. It's called Pick of the Litter. Pick of the Litter. 
So we'll try to put this uh, all this stuff at the bottom, guys, uh, afterwards. So any of these resources and stuff. Um, Alexis. Yeah, so our next question is from Erica. Um, why is there such a negative stigma around disabilities when we will all one day have a disability? I think we don't think we'll grow old. <laughs> I think there's some hope for that. We do have a sense of, res of resilience sometimes. Um, you know, this is, this is my personal philosophy, that the best way to reduce bias and stigma is through storytelling. So I think we have often not told stories about people with disabilities that reflect their real lives. Um, sometimes we over uh, exaggerate the person with a disability. Sometimes we hide the person with the disability. Um, so in my mind, one of the most important things we can do is within our marketing and communications, include people with disabilities in your marketing campaigns. Uh, don't make this something that we don't talk about or see. Uh, instead, bring it to the front and celebrate it. So I often talk about having a mental health disability, but let me tell you, I worked with the disability community for over 10 years before I ever said anything. So this is a personal journey. It's a hard journey, but it's one to be proud of. Mm -hmm. uh, this one from Tayeb Wasim, digging a bit into bias and cultural competency. Uh, he would love to hear about your thoughts on data sources from, quote, East versus, quote, West globally. And I think there were several other uh, similar types of questions regarding uh, data bias uh, from marginalized communities and, and other populations with disabilities. Yeah, uh, I was just going to mention, actually, I'll let you speak first because I have notes to show. <laughs> wow, that is true nerd right there. He just really... He has a yeah. textbook. We're talking about data applications, and you are bringing out a textbook. Should we? Talk to the people? <laughs> yeah, yeah. He got a textbook out. That wow, that was awesome. Um, I, it's hard to speak after that moment because it's too good. Um, but in all honesty, I think that bias and cultural competency uh, is an area um, that we're really just beginning to dig into. I think we all have seen, you know, articles in the news that maybe showed, uh, you know, some AI was biased against this group or that group. But now we're really down to the hard job, which is how do you collect data? Should people be paid for their data? How do we know that we're collecting it in a way that's authentic? Um, in my mind, I have more questions right now about how we do this and do it well than maybe I have solutions to talk about. But there's a textbook, so. Yeah. Uh, so while uh, me and my co-authors were writing our book, one of part of the reason to write the book was to show that you can make these AI for good apps much more easily. And here's a quick way, get motivated, learn, and then figure out, you know, get deeper into the theory. And, and across the spectrum, we have to keep mentioning about, okay, this is great, but don't forget that. And uh, one of my previous teammates who uh, is working at Facebook AI Research released a uh, paper called, Does Object Recognition Work for Everyone? Does object recognition work for everyone? And what he did and his teammates uh, is, uh, Ishan Mishra is his name. Uh, what they did was they basically looked at the concept of soap, of what is soap in Nepal versus what is soap in US, right? Uh, they looked at the concept of the same word, but what do you get in one country versus another country and how that contributes to, you know, uh, and what's the GDP of that particular country. And there was an interesting correlation between, uh, I hope it's visible here and the, the correlation is uh, the top five accuracy by income and the accuracy. So more the income, more is the accuracy of the object detector, which kind of shows some bias in the data itself, which is the best question. So amazing, amazingly correct question. And the paper you can check out is called Does Object Recognition Work for Everyone? That makes a little bit more sense now. Thank you, Mr. Cool. I appreciate, appreciate you holding up the book and, and great. <laughs> Birdie in the background helping to uh, magnify it as well. Uh, Alexis, I think let's you asked this last question, then I'll have one more question, uh, not from the audience, and then we'll close it out so that we can let our wonderful speakers get back to their evening. Go ahead, Alexis. Mm -hmm. All right, so this is from Stephen Scatliff and 
They ask um, any links for developmental resources, just any more kind of resources in that. I think I've answered two or three very quick answers. So my usual approach is look, find the easiest way to build it first to just prove it works and then go into the hard, deeper, six month long way, right? So there are, these days, many things have become no code that you don't actually even have to code or like have to code a little bit to see the proof that it works. Uh, so there are tools like uh, runway.ml. It's actually a tool for artists to get AI projects out. So you can expect what level of coding that would involve, but I usually use it and show it to scientists that you can actually do something quickly and then later on know that is this an opportunity evaluate. So that's runway.ml. There is uh, Microsoft has something called as the custom, uh, custom vision.ai, which is like a really, it's like high schoolers use it to like build an AI model and deploy it. And it does pretty uh, decently well. So they have a, a suit of you know custom vision, cognitive services suite for AI. So I, you know it's usually like scientists have spent their PhDs burning the Vinod oil building something, and if it's available in two minutes, why won't you use it, right? And then obviously, as you have seen through deep learning.ai, you know you pick up TensorFlow specialization. Uh, it kind of shows you how to you know use TensorFlow to build more solid projects so then you can deep dive into the actual neural network architecture so build something easy first and then deep dive into like the inner details but build something first which is useful what he said <laughs> <laughs> so i'll ask you this one uh one last question to both of you guys um what uh, if one thing that you would like to take away from this evening from everything you discussed what, what would be that one thing that you would like them to take back and Dr. Lawrence, we'll go to you if you don't mind. Okay. Um, to, to me, it's data. Data, data, data. We are not going to create really inclusive technology using AI unless we very intentionally collect data from diverse groups and populations. Um, and so I want people to be thoughtful. I love the idea of can you build it? Should you build it? Build something fast, see if it works, but be asking yourself the questions the entire time this fair? What would the bias be? What bias do I bring into this particular development cycle? So I think it's about being uh, questioning, uh, being thoughtful, and really thinking about long-term data and really sharing data. So I think open data initiatives are one of the places where we really need to be coming together right now. Awesome. I would, I would add uh, user before data. Uh, develop an open source, think of the final impact. Thank you very much. Alexis, thank you so much for everything you've done this evening. You did a phenomenal job. Our intern, do you have any last words? Is there one thing you, you're going to take home from the conversation tonight? Um, I think the big thing that I'm going to take away is just that there are a lot of really great things happening in the world of AI. And it's not a space for just like, men or it's just for certain types of people it's something that needs to and like can in a really awesome way involve just like everyone and benefit everyone awesome well yeah. dr cool dr lawrence you guys you're doing phenomenal work you're phenomenal advocates thank you so much for the work you're doing uh professionally for people with disabilities thank you for just being humans in this world and adding value to the community of people. It, I'm, I'm happy and I'm better for knowing both of you. Thank you for for tonight. I apologize to our audience. We couldn't get to all the questions. We tried to get to as many of them. Uh, please tune in next time for another Pi and AI, and we'll see what we talk about next time. Thank you again, everyone. And I have to say thank you to everyone in the background. Uh, Alexis did a phenomenal job orchestrating all this, but we have uh, Birdie Jackson in the background doing all the different technical things, which are much, much more difficult than you guys could ever imagine. Much, much harder than opening a book and just putting up to the camera. Uh, <laughs> as well as uh, Miss Lauren Kidd, who really helps us all to stay sane. So thank you guys, everyone. Have a good night. Thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs>